You know, the, the life of a documentary filmmaker has to be very exciting because you get to travel all over the country and see things and hear from people that most of us never really get the chance to do. And when I drove across country to take this job, it was a three-day ride down Route 80, and you passed signs for all sorts of museums, and you got to see nothing else but other than a few barns you passed along the road. But if you're shooting a documentary film, you actually have some time to go into a community, learn a little bit about it, and get some reaction, and perhaps get a flavor for what life is like there. I do want to point out you're listening to News Radio 1310 KLIX and News 1310.com. It's seven minutes after nine o'clock. 29 now, on our way to about 40 before we wrap up the day. Plenty of sunshine expected. Uh, Alan Thompson joining us this morning in studio from, gosh, all the way back in what, uh, on the East Coast somewhere? New York City, right. Well, this, uh, this is a trip for you. I mean, to come out of New York City, mm-hmm. I've been there, I think, only twice in the last 10 years for a couple of church conferences. And, uh, and I remember driving in there one time on the George Washington Bridge and thinking, I never want to do this again. <laughs> you come to a place like Idaho, it's got to be a real culture shock. Uh, somewhat, but, uh, uh, I mean, I'm from Baltimore, outside of Baltimore originally, um, sort of a quiet little suburb. Timonium uh, or, uh, Sparrows Point. Okay. I know the place. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so kind of a small little steel town. Um, so Bethlehem was there when I was a young man. Yeah. It's not there anymore. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's actually, uh, pretty nice coming into, into towns like this. It reminds me of home a little bit. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the subject matter is, has been definitely controversial and it's, Several states where this is happening, uh, Maine, uh, in the Dakotas, uh, Montana, just this past weekend, uh, there was a a big demonstration there, and we're seeing it especially in Twin Falls and Boise here. Uh, Is there a particular focus of the documentary? Is it about the culture clash? I mean, I I think that that would certainly be a part of it. Uh, I think that our job uh, in particular is to come in and be as objective as possible to present uh, facts to present situations that are going on, um, and just to observe and to present it as honest as possible. You have seen though the two sides, and one side says we don't want this. We're afraid of what this could bring, mm-hmm. and then you've got the other side which says, "Well, you're just being bigoted about this." Uh, from what you've observed, you've probably not found anyone who's really that extreme on either side, have you? Or do those people crop up? Uh, the extremists on both sides. Uh, sure. Yeah, they they show up. Um, I think in anything uh, rooted in any argument, you know, from either side, at least from what I've seen, kind of filming this over the last three months, in you know, like you said, different cities across the U.S., is that somewhere in every argument is is uh, uh, is something that's that's very rooted in in something that matters to some you know to someone in particular. Like uh, uh, I think you mentioned yesterday, the city council meeting that happened last night. And, uh, and there was a, a woman there who's a small business owner, and, and her uh, concern was the small business and how, you know, different workers kind of go in uh, to sort of bigger corporations or, or bigger, uh, you know, plants and stuff like that, dairy farms that you have around here, um, and how that kind of churns and keeps going and going, and smaller businesses in this area are shrinking and shrinking. Um, and... and, and... There's a concern, I think, on the local level. It's not so much about a clash of cultures per se, because Idaho has some, you know, its history. You had, you know, Mormons coming here. They colonized it once. It failed. They came back. You've got the Irish that, that came into one end of the state as well and worked in the mines. And so you had a number of different cultures here. You Probably in the formation of this state, you did not see a lot of the traditional bigotries that may have existed in, let's say, New York City in 1840 mm-hmm. or 1850. And and so that really hasn't been, I think, a key of this. But things really got ramped up after uh, uh, Paris and after San Bernardino. I think mm-hmm. you saw that as well. And, mm-hmm. and, and even a lot of people who'd been not necessarily extreme about this suddenly got very extreme. Right. You're seeing that. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say so, yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know where that comes from, what the root might be. Uh, but I think that's part of the documentary is to try to find out in the U.S. Uh, what people feel. And especially, you know, when situations like that happen, Paris or San Bernardino, uh, yeah, just to cover uh, and, and to see uh, what happens. Are you getting any hostility while you're doing the, doing oh, the sure. project? Sure, yeah. yeah. What, 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 along what lines? Uh, hostility just in terms of, uh, I think when you say you're making a documentary about refugees, uh, people immediately think you're taking one side or saying one particular thing and, uh, you know, we're still filming it. <laughs> so it's not even close to being finished. Uh, 
and and I guess the beauty of documentary too is the fact that uh, you know you can kind of steer one way and think it's going to be a particular thing when you get someplace and you're kind of rooted, like you said, in a in a town. You meet people. Things always change. So the idea of having everything in the can once we get back, you know, into New York City, you know, shooting three four months uh, to actually sit back and look at it in the editing room. And then to carve out the story afterwards. I mean, it's 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 a piece that constantly writes itself, and it won't be finished until it's 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 ready to go. I have been, of course, in the center of this controversy here, mm -hmm. uh, just by the fact that I'm the local radio talk show host. Right. And no matter who's in this chair is going to end up, it, because it's topical and mm -hmm. it becomes it becomes an issue. And yet, you know, I hear some nasty things said about me at public meetings as well from people mm -hmm. I don't even know. Mm -hmm. I, I went to college with Pakistanis and Indians who were among my best friends. I uh, worked with a fellow in television for many, many years in upstate New York who, uh, whose uh, mother was from Turkey and his father from Pakistan. We're still very, very close. He's alarmed himself. I mean, this mm -hmm. is the thing. These, these, it's, it, it's not necessarily somebody just saying, you know, we've got to stop this and I'm not doing it for, for ratings because when I moved here, I never thought I'm going to come to Twin Falls and talk about Islam and refugee resettlement. It wasn't on my radar. Mm -hmm. until the story really became news last spring. And then it seemed for about six months, it's what we talked about every day. Then when the political establishment suddenly backed off the program and a lot of the support seemed to drain out of it when the governor and, and a lot of other legislators said, maybe we need to think about this a bit more, mm -hmm. things quieted down uh, or seemed to have. But the program is still in place. That hasn't, hasn't changed to any degree. Mm -hmm. And from what I have found is that there is one side out there, and I understand how they feel, and that is the argument goes, we have to be compassionate. We're good people. They try to quote Emma Lazarus as if that's actual policy. It's not of the Constitution, by the way. It's a poem, right, mm -hmm. on a statue. Right. And and they seem to feel that if you disagree with them, uh, that you are a you know cultural illiterate or that you have a low IQ or that you just don't like people who are different – I can't find any common ground with them. And I don't know that it will ever exist because they have, in my view, a haughty opinion. Mm -hmm. And as a filmmaker, you're talking to everybody out there with the differing views. Sure. If you could play Peacemaker, how would you go about bringing those sides together? Ooh, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's a difficult question. Um, uh, you know, just to kind of backtrack a little bit, I think uh, one of the points you made um, just – you know, when you when you talk about a place like Twin Falls versus somewhere like New York City or San Francisco, which mm -hmm. are two other stories that we have in this documentary when it's all said and done, is I mean, you can walk down the street in any of those cities and you're going to find a bunch of different cultures, um, and you're going to see people of all types of different skin color. To to come in Twin Falls, and it, you know, not to say that one thing is the norm, but um, to see a Congolese person who's six foot five walking down the street is a little different. Um, not necessarily a bad thing, uh, but it's it's different. And uh, I mean, to play Peacemaker, I, I don't know if, to, to, to bridge a gap, I don't know. Uh, I think my job personally to present uh, as honestly as possible the two sides you know that exist. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I, I think another point of documentary film is to create a conversation. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not something that, again, it's, it's, once it's finished, it's finished, but it's, the conversation will always continue. Do you think that that in itself at least will start to maybe get people to look at other people's opinions and maybe some dialogue will help? I certainly hope so. And I certainly hope that people come to it with an open mind and don't come in, uh, you know, maybe with a certain stance or, or thinking that we're going to say a specific thing. And instead, if they just come in are open to watching it, open to seeing uh, a humanitarian perspective of kind of what might be going on, uh, you know, from the people who live here, from the people who are coming here, uh, and then just to, to to judge after it's all said and done. Well, you know, your, your reference to where you, you grew up, I was driving down Route 83 some years ago, uh, and I was coming from upstate New York, and I was going to the eastern shore, and mm -hmm. I was daydreaming and missed my turn, and the next thing I know, I'm coming into downtown Baltimore behind the wrap-up of the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Mm -hmm. Didn't know where I was. Ended up going downtown by a restaurant named the James Joyce, which was packed with all the party goers. <laughs> Got around the corner, there's a big hotel, and there's two men, seven feet tall or so, black men, mm -hmm. 
but in Baltimore, that's not unusual. When I said, how do I get back to Route 95? One of them in a very perfect, almost British accent says, well, the first thing you would do, and he sent me out around past the stadiums and I got back on the highway, but still I needed to get to Route 50. I got off the highway and none of the local folks knew that. Mm-hmm. They didn't know where, what was on the next block, but the two guys who were here from Africa, mm-hmm. they knew. They mm-hmm. knew their way around and they knew their geography and their directions. But in, in a place like that urban setting, I think you're right, you wouldn't find any of that unusual. Mm-hmm. But to come into a farming community where things have been pretty much quiet for the last 100 years, Mm -hmm. uh, anything different, I think people, even in Baltimore, if someone actually showed up after that parade and not just dressed in green, but if they were actually green, people would be a little bit surprised because it would be unusual, right? Uh, In Baltimore? Uh, Maybe. I don't know. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, it might be possible. Um, Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, especially with that kind of an urban setting growing up, uh, just with a mix of all types of different people. Um, yeah, it might have been different, and, and yeah, yeah, sorry. But there's violence in, in, in those urban areas as well, and sure. I think that seeing something different, people who've, who've lived a life in a, in a relatively quiet, sedate culture, if you will, for many, many years, anything different is, is, is going to raise the question, will this eventually bring violence? Because there's always that line, diversity makes us stronger, but no one can actually come up with any social science evidence that that's true. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and I suspect that there's a lot of that going on. It's just, it, 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 there's got to be a way to sort of calm the nerves. And I don't think anyone has come up with a subject because the other side is just screaming bigot every time. Sure, sure. That's a, that's a great point. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, kind of to what you said, you know, relating it back to Baltimore is, uh, you know, I'm the product of, of middle class steel workers. Uh, and, uh, so for me to kind of grow up near a city like Baltimore and to, to hear about violence, but at the same time to see a steel mill that uh, supported an entire area being collapsed um, solely by greed, uh, to me, you know, looking at what might be evil is not so much someone who might be a different skin color carrying a gun. It might be somebody who has uh, a certain power who is, you know, really destroying an entire town. Um, so for me, you know, the, the idea of, of what might be bad, what might be good is, is very skewed. Uh, someone who is a different color who lives in a city uh, doesn't strike me as bad as someone who, you know, lives in a mansion in the Hamptons and is closing a steel mill uh, and, and, you know, taking people of my family out of jobs. So, so the idea of evil or what might rub people the wrong way, what might rub people the right way, you know, what they might be comfortable with, uh, it, it's always a gray area. Um, and it kind of depends on on, you know, I think where you come from, what the situation is, but also uh, to present something as objectively if, as possible, which I'm trying to do with this documentary is... Well, hold that thought for a sure. moment. Alan Thompson is joining us in the studio. He's doing a documentary about re- refugee resettlement throughout many communities in this country. And he's also interested a bit in your feedback, too, as well, where you're standing on the issue. If you'd like to join us on the other end of the break, please feel free to give us a call at 736-0300. Our guest is Alan Thompson, joining us this morning on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and NewsRadio1310.com. He is a documentary filmmaker, and he is doing a movie about refugee resettlement and really about the impact it's having across the country. And as he said, he's doing this from an objective perspective, just trying to get a lot of different voices on it. And he hopes that by putting this movie together, people will be able to see the film and then stand back and make some decisions and might actually even heal some of the uh, the disagreements that people have. We'll get to our telephone callers in just a moment, but first I, I do want to quickly mention, if I could, tomorrow morning between 8.30 and 9 o'clock, we're going to be joined by one of the medical professionals from Trip Family Medicine right here in studio. We do this every Wednesday morning between 8.30 and 9 o'clock. One of the doctors or one of the physician's assistants will be joining us. If you have a medical problem or other issue and you'd like to talk to a friendly voice and perhaps get pointed in the right direction, p- please feel free to give us a call tomorrow morning. Uh, we do it every Wednesday. Trip Family Medicine is located directly across the street from the main post office here in Twin Falls on Fillmore Street. And they'd like to remind you, life's too short not to feel good. Uh, Alan, we have a telephone caller joining us. Okay. And you're up next. You're on the air with a filmmaker. Yes. Good morning, Bill and Alan. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to make a comment on what you were just talking about, diversity and things like that. When our government lied to us 
sneak under the back door quietly, continuously lie. That gets people riled up. And like we've said previously in the show, uh, when they come in, the governor, he comes in, says everything's good. We'll take and relook at it. And then there's no more said about it. But then things are pushed down our throat, like uh, making too much noise at a church. People complain about that. But yet you could have the call to prayer five times a day, and that makes a lot more noise than people singing in a church. Things like this, uh, there's always something bad going on that they're not telling you, and they're just quietly sneaking it in on you. I, yeah. we'll, we'll let we'll let Alan respond to that. Uh, I think what he's referring to is just we've gotten to a point where there's a lack of trust in institutions, and so anytime someone says this will be okay, there's going to be a group of people who say, "Wait a minute." Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and um, I think th- thank you by the way as well uh, for for your opinion and uh, and and kind of for your insight as well. Um, but uh, you know, I I don't think uh, the blame. Uh, personally, should be so much on the people uh, who already practice these things, who are already here. Uh, um, I mean, you know, you, you kind of made a reference to institutions and and what might be going on with that. And yeah, that that's certainly a big thing. That's certainly, uh, I mean, that maybe should uh, have the finger pointed at a little more than than the people who, uh, you know, were born into a certain way, um, uh, who are already here and just continue to live their lives. I want to thank you for the call, and we have a follow-up call. Uh, you're up next at 927. It's 30. And you're on the air on KLIX. Go ahead. Good morning. One of the things last night at the city council meeting I noticed, and and uh, something that hasn't been brought up, I know Bill's done a great job with covering um, this stuff. Um, you know, bringing his sworn enemy into your quiet community, I think is kind of the elephant in the room, like last night at the city council meeting even. Um, There's concerns voiced, obviously, of, you know, bringing in uh, a lot of refugees and having, you know, uh, taking jobs away and stuff and all that. That is a huge concern. But also, you know, we don't know who the enemy is. And, you know, that's a huge concern for a lot of family people out there. This this is a, you know, pretty God-fearing community here. And we're bringing in, we've, been, we've had 15 years about of war with an enemy sworn to kill us. Well, we'll let, we'll let uh, Alan pick up on that. Uh, and, and obviously that's the idea that there could be a sleeper or a sleeper cell involved in any of this. Sure, sure. Um, but to my knowledge, uh, I, I don't think Twin Falls, and maybe you can correct me, Bill, uh, has resettled many from the Middle East. Uh, isn't it mainly Congolese? If, um, if they, it may, mainly Africans, and I think if any came here from the Middle East originally, they were probably Chaldeans, okay. and uh, they came with a Christian background. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, certainly maybe in bigger cities, uh, you know, I, I'm sure that that's a possibility. I mean, San Bernardino, that could very well be uh, the possibility for that. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I think uh, it, it's, it's, it's hard to say that you should trust uh, someone to do a background check and to be thorough. Um, I hope that that would happen, um, but certainly they, uh, you know, institutions, the government should, uh, you know, reassess, um, you know, how they're vetting people. Um, absolutely. I want to thank him for the call, and we have a short break coming up. Alan Thompson is in studio with us. He's a documentary filmmaker. He'll be taking more of your telephone calls in the next half hour of the program. You're listening to News Radio 1310, KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. The show is Top Story with Bill Colley. And if you're looking to call on the other side of the break, the telephone number 736 0300. Our studio guest is putting together a documentary film. Uh, about uh, refugee resettlement in various communities across the United States, including right here in the Magic Valley. If you'd like to reach our program today, 736-0300, 736-0300. I'll just ask that our current caller stay on hold for a moment because i got to mention a couple of things here about business. News Radio 1310, KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. Alan Thompson is our studio guest. Bill Colley with you on Top Story this morning. We're at 933, and we have 30. 
And we've got to ask you before we get to the next caller, what are you going to call the film? Uh, it's still it's still up in the air, uh, possibly considering uh, the resettled. Yeah. So at, at some point you'll have a name, and then there'll be a theatrical release or perhaps a DVD or something will be available. Yeah, everything we do goes up online. Um, I work for a nonprofit, so everything goes up online for free. Um, and it's just, uh, it's called Suchi, and it's just T-Z-U-C-H-I dot U-S. And you can find, you know, other videos we made uh, all up there. Um, and yeah, hopefully, you know, cut something together, maybe go into film festivals, maybe hopefully come back to the cities that we filmed in and uh, have a longer discussion. Big premiere would be great here. That would be great, yeah. We have a caller with us, and you're on the air with our guest, Alan Thompson. Good morning. Good morning. I think that they're probably, you know, with happened in the past with the refugees coming in here, uh, the fact that we're bringing in these unvetted Syrian refugees and the fact that Islam itself has declared war on the world. I mean, all of that changed, and we can see that happening, how they've taken over Europe and so forth. We see the, the uh, killings in, of our servicemen, uh, San Diego, uh, not San Diego, but Santa Bernardino, and so forth. And our our government has even indicated that ISIS is infiltrating and using the refugee center. So we're really putting our community at risk, great risk, all over across this country. And of course, not only the terrorists through the jihad and terrorism, but also the fact of just population jihad, bringing in millions of people just over take the local communities and bring in Sharia law and that's already happening. And so this is the main concerns. And the other thing of course is jobs. And I think it really comes out that they're replacing American workers all over the country right here locally with cheaper labor that they can get. And it's all about American businessmen greed in my opinion. You, you, uh, Alan have been hearing, I think a lot of that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, actually, one of the, the pieces we filmed was in Detroit. Um, it was actually right outside of Detroit in, in an area called Dearborn, uh, which is a, a huge Arabic influence. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's so much that when you walk down the streets, the signs are in English and Arabic. Uh, so it's sort of like, you know, anywhere in New York City where, you know, there's a million different languages. But, you know, in somewhere like Detroit, uh, it's, it's kind of a shock. Um, the thing uh, that you mentioned about, uh, I mean, especially about, American greed, um, yeah. Uh, I mean, you could you could take Detroit as a prime example of of that, and you could kind of look. Um, you know, one of the gentlemen that we we talked with, we interviewed with, uh, he was working at a factory in Detroit. Uh, it's kind of similar to what the dairies do here, where they hire uh, these immigrants, these refugees who come in, uh, because there aren't a lot of people who would want these jobs otherwise. Uh, there aren't a lot of people who would be willing to get dirty, who'd be willing to, you know, kind of. You know, even in a place like Detroit that was built on, you know, it, it founded a huge part of the country. Um, and uh, and just to, to your point as well, um, just kind of about, uh, you know, the Islam declaring war and, and, and things like that. Uh, I think it's a little heavy handed uh, personally. Um, uh, again, in Detroit, one of the gentlemen we spoke with was um, he was an Iraqi uh, refugee. Uh, and he actually, the, one of the main reasons he got out was because, uh, and this was on his own accord, he was, he was a car salesman otherwise, he was uh, translating for the U.S. military. Uh, so he was translating in between, you know, Arabic and English, and he was working with them as a translator, which, you know, is a highly dangerous job. They're normally, you know, if they're not killed first uh, in the line of fire, you know, just in the fact that they're dealing with people, they are hunted afterwards. Um, so he was literally in a situation where he uh, he was told if he left his house, he and his family would be murdered. You would find, though, that I think most Americans would understand that if somebody was allied with us and we have to get them out for safety reasons, that they would be accepted. Uh, that, that, that's something that we wouldn't have an issue with. Well, uh, that, that's another part of, of kind of his story is that he didn't want to wear any of that on his sleeve. He still has family that's back there. So to walk around and kind of say, oh, no, 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 you should accept me because of this – uh, he couldn't, and he wasn't really willing to talk about it uh, just because he still feared for his family back home. We have uh, more coming up in just a few minutes with uh, with Alan uh, Thompson uh, putting together a documentary film about refugee resettlement in this country. He'll take more of your calls, too, as well. We're at 940. We've got 31. Bill Colley with you as well on News Radio 1310 KLIX, News Radio 1310.com. 
And if I could quickly mention, we have a new location for Tint Lady. Now at 127 Filer Avenue on the corner of Washington and Filer, a much more visible location. And with the weather getting warmer, eventually, you may start thinking about window tints because when we have those triple-digit days in the summer, that'll help keep your home or your office cooler. And you can get a free estimate by calling 736-8469 or go to TintLadyIdaho.com where they have more than 20 years' experience in the business. And remember, don't squint, get tint. Our studio guest, Alan Thompson, is putting together a documentary film and going to deal with the refugee resettlement issue here in the Magic Valley, as well as in communities across the country, rural, suburban, and urban. And we'll get back to our telephone callers in just a moment. Stay patient. If I picked up your call, stay on the line. I just would like to mention very quickly, we're at 944. It's 31. Bill Colley with you as well on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. And I do want to mention High Desert Meat Processing in Twin Falls, where one animal is processed at a time, and what you bring in is exactly what you'll get back. Darren Van Horn, the owner of High Desert Meat Processing, he's been doing this for almost 35 years. He has a Facebook page. High Desert Meat Processing is on Facebook, where you can see reviews of customers. Or you can give him a telephone call for all of your wild game and domestic needs, 734-9949. High Desert Meat does in-house smoking. Nothing gets shipped out. Specialty meats, too. Jerky, salami, summer sausage, kielbasa, breakfast sausage, uh, brats, Polish dogs, hot dogs, and more. USDA approved. And he works closely with local beef growers on their programs to ensure quality meat. 734-9949. And we have a caller joining us. Uh, you're up next. You're on the air with a filmmaker. Yeah, good morning. You know, I hear you talking about all the time. Are you there? We are. We're listening. Anyway, all the time about the, um, uh, the refugees. Well, I put 22 years in the Navy. Back in the 70s, I was paid to shoot Vietnamese. Now it's 1983. My last ship, we're 500 miles from land. We approach a sinking Vietnamese fishing craft, 67 people on board. They left Vietnam with 100. We rescued them. I have pictures of my shipmates carrying babies up the side of the ship off of the sinking boat. We were told that 10% or 15% of these people could be former Viet Cong. What I'm saying is they all ain't good guys. You know, you got to sort them out, but, you know, it's just that you you got to have a little compassion. So, anyway, that's my story. Thank you. Uh, your reaction to that? Yeah, thank you, and, and, and thank you for your service as well. Uh, my grandfather was in World War II in the Navy, so I, I respect anybody who served. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I really uh, I, I appreciate the opinion, um, and I appreciate the compassion as well at, at the very end. Uh, it's refreshing to hear. Um and uh, you know that's that's actually another part of this documentary is 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 we met with a gentleman in San Francisco who was a boat person. He left when he was uh, uh, six, seven years old, uh, and was on a tiny fishing boat with, like you said, fifty, sixty others. Um, you know, for being that young, you know, I don't I don't think he declared anything with the Viet Cong, and he's been happily settled in San Francisco ever since. Uh, he was just happy to get the chance. Um, uh, but yeah, thank you for your call. Yeah, my, my, uh, one of my roommates in graduate school was uh, 12 at the fall of Saigon. And then on the boat, they got robbed by pirates. And yet he managed to come to this country and end up uh, becoming a great success. So yeah. it can't happen. And now Vietnam would be considered a strong U.S. ally in that part of the world. Yeah. You're up next. You're on the air with our filmmaking guest. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm calling because every time we talk about refugees... Hello? Yes, you're on the air. Oh, okay. Um, they always talk about um, the, only the Syrians being a problem. But uh, I don't think that that is, um, I don't think we should look at it like that. Because the, the idea of uh, people coming from the Middle East who are Muslims, the, the Islamic religion is a political system. And... As a political system, um, it doesn't really matter whether they come from Iraq, Afghanistan, or Syria, or Jordan, or anywhere else. They are still part of that political system. And the idea that, uh, that, they, that people from these other areas would be okay because they were vetted by our State Department and or our military, 
that gives me absolutely no comfort whatsoever. Can I add something to that? Our, our caller mentioned the Vietnamese boat people. By 1983, the war was long over with, almost a decade. And it was not a religious war by any means. It was ideological, if I recall, from I was young too at the time. But she brings up a point, and that is an argument being made that if people are actually practicing Islam, I mean, and, and fundamentalist Islam, and the way it was prescribed when it started, mm-hmm. uh, they have a mission. And that mission is counter to a lot of what we believe and what we do, where if someone is is not a threat, they may be just casually uh, a Muslim. And uh, in a way, they're not even, uh, you know, they're, they're almost an apostate in that sense. But I think her point is, is, is maybe well said. We may never be able to mesh these cultures together if someone is practicing their faith seriously as a Muslim. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting point, and, and thank you again for your call. Um, uh, yeah, uh, you know, it's it's something I, I have yet to come across, um, and, and it's something uh, as well in, in, you know, coming from, you know, a city like New York and, uh, and kind of seeing practices there, it, it, it is skewed, it is different. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I, I'm not entirely sure, like, exactly how to answer that. Um, uh, it, it, it is hard to vet someone that way or, or to even consider it. Um, if someone is practicing something that might be radical, um, how would you know? Well, it, you know, think about it, too. If, if, if we as uh, Christians or Jews, were, if we all decided we were going to follow all of those laws from the Old Testament mm-hmm. to the T, mm-hmm. um, we would be taking people outside the encampment and stoning them to death for various infractions. So. We have, over a course of the last couple of thousand years, evolved in, culturally to where we don't do that, mm-hmm. um, and yet we're we're going to be dealing with many people who still they're told to do this, and if you really and they're told if you really believe, mm-hmm. um, they're they're torn. I mean, they would be terribly torn. Right, and I, I think it's uh, it, it might be, and I can't speak for you know obviously everybody. Um, uh, I, I think it might be a bit more casual, um, you know, especially in terms of their religion, the way that they might accept it. Uh, like you said, similar to the way if an Albanian, for instance, who's a Muslim, probably practices his faith a lot. It's nowhere near what a Wahhabist would do. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. And you know, in the same way that you know, someone who's uh, I don't know uh, a Mormon pra- practices different from a Catholic, or someone who's a Lutheran practices different from a Protestant or a Baptist. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure. You know exactly how to. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll take an, another caller with okay, us. Sure. It's seven three six zero three hundred, and you're on the air with Alan Thompson on KLIX. Yes, uh, you know, in Europe, I get the feeling that the media is covering it up because it seems so destabilized. There seems to be a wash with, you know, refugees, and uh, I just was wondering, like for instance, the EU has been pressuring Austria because they want to restrict the refugees from coming in. Gun sales in in Austria is through the roof. And so I was just curious if you felt that way. I'll hang up. I, I'm I'm sorry. What could was there a question in there? I, I don't. Uh, I think he's, he's just referencing the fact that it's really changed culture in Europe, and the fact that we've seen a, almost a 180 with the public opinion and people buying weapons to protect themselves. Okay. And, but Ann Coulter said the other day, I saw some comments she made where she said. If people don't understand the rise of Donald, Donald Trump, it's because he's addressing six fears, mm-hmm. and this was one of them. And mm-hmm. and as I guess um, we have to look at that, and probably in this country, and wonder if if we're going to go that direction too, that nationalist sort of wall that we'll throw up. I don't know. I, um, it's it's hard to say. I think it's uh, you know, the, especially the point of this documentary is dealing with uh, situations in the United States. Uh, so to compare how we would look at you know somewhere in Europe, the way they're handling it. It, that would be a completely different documentary and something that we're not really focusing on. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I, I don't. I, it, it's it's really hard to say. Um, you know, especially in uh, in bigger cities, the way that they might handle it versus uh, you know smaller places, places where you can you know uh, carry and conceal. Um, you know where you, that that's allowed. You know, somewhere in New York, you can't do that. Um, I don't know. It's yeah. It, I, I don't think that uh, that it'll go towards the way that Europeans are, are dealing with it. Um, but but the point of this documentary is to find out how the United States and different cities are dealing with it. We have another caller. You're on the air on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Go ahead. Good morning, guys. I grew up in Detroit. 
when I was living at Lake Tahoe, one of my friends from Dearborn, Michigan, came out and uh, told me that a black friend of his came up to him and told him, you got to move out of this neighborhood. And Dave said, why? He says, the Arabs are moving in. And Dave said, what's wrong with that? He said, hey, man, they cut your throat, and they don't even take your wallet. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I, well, I, I'm still alive, and I'm in it other. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know. I, um, I I'm a little conflicted in the way that you heard your story. It was a friend of a friend of a friend. Uh, but um, yeah, certainly, I, I would recommend going back to Detroit and kind of seeing what what is going on. Uh, I read somewhere. I think it was the Washington Post last week. A new study is out that says people uh, from Latin and Asian, East Asian ancestry that have come to the United States within a couple of generations simply identify as white or Caucasian mm -hmm. and that uh, that we've we've always wondered does the melting pot work well in that case it does i guess the question has become people are asking this after chattanooga and san bernardino and the like or the lackawanna 6 i mentioned that off the air to you mm -hmm. is it possible that that we will never see quite that bit of assimilation among muslims coming here as we do with let's say east asians and latinos I don't. I don't think so. Um, I mean, I. I think especially uh, if 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 there is the turmoil that there is that continues in the Middle East, uh, the way that we personally view it back here will always be different. Um, but I, I. I think that you know, with with time, uh, it it will become better. And that and that maybe if the war would stop there or the wars that perhaps people would find a way to finally get along a little bit better even here domestically. If, if they figure out a better situation for what might be going on overseas. We have a time for I think one last quick call. It's nine fifty five and you're up next thirty two right now at our studio. You're on the air. Yes, I wonder if if your guest. I came in a little bit late today. Has a has a final dollar amount approximately of what these refugees cost us? Uh, it would be interesting to know that. Thank you. Yeah, that's something that we're going, uh, you know, city to city uh, and 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 asking about. Yeah, um, uh, the final overall will be a part of our documentary for sure. Um, so yeah, we'll be looking into that. Thank you. We 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 have I think uh, and, and and we talked about this just briefly earlier. You've got a country where jobs have been hemorrhaged. They've moved overseas. I was reading Pat Buchanan's column this morning, and he was trying to explain uh, the rise of both Trump and Sanders. And, you know, bringing people in, maybe at a time when there was a lot of empty space in this country, it was done easily. I guess a lot of the questions people are raising is, is we don't need the competition. It may have nothing to do with anyone's faith or their ethnicity. It's just the fact that if I want a job at the at making yogurt, I've got to compete now with these people. And I think that there's a lot of bitterness about that. Yeah, there might be. Um, yeah, that's that's an interesting point. Directed sure. at the government, maybe not necessarily at the refugees, but the refugee is the guy you think has taken your job, and all of a sudden your anger is directed in, in, at that person. Yeah, and and I think that's that's a good point as well, is to see where that anger goes, is to see, you know, is it is it because of this person who uh, is trying to start a new life, or is it because of layers and layers of of just uh, you know top tier people who don't care as long as the job gets done doesn't matter to them and they may not be too worried too about who gets vetted because it's it's all about the quick buck right sure absolutely I mean yeah if you look at you know the dairy farms around here I mean they used undocumented workers for so long and now they're using people who are documented uh, and there's still you know tension. I was going to say I, I, I met actually a state legislator who admitted that he used to hire undocumented workers, mm -hmm. uh, but he's opposed to uh, refugee, resettling Muslim refugees. So uh, it, it depends on, I guess, what's best for your business, right? Sure, sure. But that's, uh, that, and, and it might be selfish interest that in the long run rule most people's decisions. Uh, maybe, maybe. Um, yeah, yeah, possibly. Uh, yeah, I think if there were people who would be willing to do a specific job, uh, without complaining, then they might be able to find it. I want to thank you for coming by today. Thanks so much, Bill. And when you're ready to release the film, we'll perhaps have you back on the air. Have to be by telephone, I'm sure. But if you come here for a premiere, uh, we can do this all over again. I would love that. That would be great. And thank you to all the callers as well. I really appreciate it. Can we quickly mention you have a photographer working with you, and they never get a lot of credit. <laughs> uh, what's his name? His name is Neil Zakant. N i l s a u c a n t e. So we we both work together. Yeah. I, I worked in television for a number of years, and. 
you know, they did introduce me, but the poor photographer who actually did most of the legwork never got a lot of credit. So I, yeah, he, he does a lot of legwork. So <laughs> <laughs> All right. coming up, following news at 10 o'clock from Fox, it's Rush Limbaugh right here on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Tomorrow morning, we expect we'll be joined by Raul Labrador at 8 15. Uh, he may even be able tomorrow to take some of your telephone calls. God willing, if the creek don't rise, they'll allow me to do this all over again tomorrow morning.